Kia ora, I'm Dr. Susie Wiles and welcome to COVID Chat, uh, the chat where we talk science about COVID-19 and answer your questions. Um, before I introduce Damien, a first an apology. It's formal Friday and I forgot and here I am in my t-shirt, but wait until you see Damien. Um, so yeah, introducing Damien from the Aotearoa Science Agency. Hello, Susie. Hi. I, ben has decided, Ben, who runs things in the background for us, has decided that um, I suit black and white today, apparently, to make me look more like a lounge singer, which uh, is nice. Um, this uh, this formal Friday goes out to the inimitable Hilary Barry, who's, um, I think, basically came up with this concept for New Zealand and has been really championing it every Friday and is looking stunning in her own tuxedo uh, today. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us on, on this Friday show. Uh, the last Friday, we hope, in Level 4. Ever, we hope. Um, and as usual, your questions, um, we've got heaps of your questions, but we welcome more. NZCOVID at gmail.com uh, is where you can reach us. Um, we will be answering those uh, in a few minutes. Um, first of all, we're going to be taking a big look um, at COVID-19 and how it uh, affects children. Um, but first of all, uh, Susie's got today's figures. Susie. Yeah, so another sad day with um, another death again in somebody um, who uh, is one of the older and more vulnerable people. Um, so our thoughts go out to their family, um, but still a low number of cases. So um, five again today. Uh, if we have a look at that. Where's our graph? There we go. Um, five cases. So that looks like a pretty impressive curve, New Zealand. Let's um, keep it looking like that. And if we look at our total, 1,456. So we're doing really well, and it's really important that we keep doing what we're doing so that we can keep those numbers low. Because when we look overseas, it is still obviously a very sad situation, um, now up at over 2.7 million confirmed cases. Um, it's sort of rising by almost 100,000 every day. It's very sad. But let's get on to today's big topic, topic um, kids and COVID-19. So... When we head into Alert Level 3 next week, uh, schools and early childhood education centres are going to be opening up um, for those children uh, up to year 10 whose parents aren't able to keep them at home. Um, so six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, we were telling kids, and I was one of those people, saying keep your children away from grandparents and other vulnerable people. So what's changed? Why on earth are we opening up schools and, uh, and kindies? Um, so I'm a parent. And I remember when my daughter started kindy and she came home bringing every lurgy going for about six months and we all got those diseases. Um, you know, kids are amazing vectors of infectious diseases. Um, so six, seven weeks ago, the, the data that was coming out of China was suggesting that actually COVID-19 was relatively rare in children. They had very few cases and it did look like if they got it, it was a pretty mild infection. But what wasn't clear at the time is whether the cases in children were being missed, um, perhaps they didn't present in the same way, or maybe they were the asymptomatic spreaders of this um, virus. And so with that little knowledge and the knowledge we have about children in general, we decided to advise a better safe than sorry approach. And that was why we gave the advice we did. Now, of course, we are several <laughs> weeks um, um, further ahead and there is a lot more information around. And fortunately, a um, fantastic group of pediatricians in Australia or in the UK have got together. They're called Don't Forget the Bubbles. And they have a fantastic website, actually, where there's all sorts of really important information about kids and COVID-19. Um, but they've done a big review of the literature a little bit about what they've um, found in, in that review of the literature and why uh, opening up the schools in the way that we're doing that is um, safe. So the research shows, uh, studies in China now, Italy, Japan, Spain and the USA, that fewer kids get COVID-19. ...have made up about...
And uh, what I was told was that about 5,500 under 15s have been tested. They've been swabbed for COVID-19 tested positive. So again, relative to the number of tests done and the positivity rate in children, they're much more, uh, much less likely to be positive. But we have had some cases here in children and overseas. So what happens to those? So the studies show that children on the whole seem to get a mild infection. There have been some children around the world who have died. It's a very small number at the moment. Um, so it looks like actually having a bad time from COVID-19 is relatively rare for children. Um, and even if they have underlying health to give the virus to children, then children are beasties that they are. Who do have to go to work uh, and you can't keep your children at home, then basically they're safe to go to school. What's really important is that you as the grown-up keep your distance from other grown-ups and the teachers. And I'm afraid teachers, you need to stay away from your colleagues. So no hanging out in the tea room at least until we get back to level two. So with that, let's bring back Damien to um, answer some, well, we'll ask your questions. <laughs> I did actually see a, a question um, somewhere else, Susie, that say, well, since my kids are going back to school, does that mean my bubble is now the bubble of all their class? I, th I think everyone was hoping that they could all have a, a parents get together and, uh, you know, since they're all sending their kids together as this common element, but that's very much not the case, as you say. Yeah, so if the kids are not going to be the ones spreading it, it's really, really important that you as the parents don't hang out together. Yeah, sorry guys. Um, Bridget, that's just come in uh, through the email. Um, hope you're watching, Bridget. Um, Susie, can you give me any advice on newborn babies born in lockdown? When should I isolate my new baby until? Is it safe to send my toddler to place in there at level two or could he bring it back to our baby? Is it safe for me and the baby to go out at level two or level one? So again, um, having looked at the literature, there's been some studies um, publishing what's happened to to newborns again um relatively unscathed uh you know so it does seem to be um not too bad remember newborns are vulnerable to other things so i would say in this instance treat your newborn as you would be with other um other infections so it's safe for you to go out but don't let other people come near your baby or touch your baby you know any of those kinds of things um as for the toddlers, again, because we don't see, because they don't appear to be the big vectors of diseases, um, uh, if your child would be going to school normally, then then that would be okay. But remember, um, kids are supposed to be at home if you can be at home. So if you don't, if you aren't, if you're home with a newborn, then keep your child with you too, because that um, reduces the number of children that actually do have to be at school. Yeah, and don't let any nice old ladies um, pick up and, and try and kiss or cuddle your newborn baby in any event, right? That's a, as they are want to do from time to time. Definitely not. Um, Adrian has the question. <laughs> um, I woke up this morning uh, with the question, does COVID-19 have a smell? He asked Google, uh, and it seems if it does, it would be too small to detect. But um, there are, uh, could it be a smell that's trained by, do you know, trained for dogs to smell or beagles? Anything useful there? Yeah, so this is a super interesting question. And actually, um, thank you. Uh, so um, Adrian actually linked to a paper um, that was a, uh, so some dogs that were trained to uh, see whether they could detect um, cells that had been infected with different kinds of, a uh, couple of different kinds of viruses. And it turns out that the cells had made what we call volatile compounds, so compounds that end up in the air. Um, and the dogs were um, able to detect these compounds compared to cells that don't, that weren't infected. So the question is, would this work um, in, you know, in an infection? So it's not um, a crazy idea. And actually, there's uh, there's been a group in New Zealand who several years ago proposed using this to try and di diagnose tuberculosis. So 
that's a lung infection. Um, and it was based on the fact that actually when the bacteria, so there's a bacterial infection, when the bacteria grow, they might also produce some of these um, volatile compounds. And so what they did was they um, they grew the bacteria in, a, in the lab and then they sampled the air uh, that was grown, you know, in the flasks um, and then showed that actually it did make some volatile compounds that the um, that a machine could measure. Uh, when this got moved to human trials, it turned out that actually um, you couldn't, there was the same kinds of compounds that are made by people who are smokers. So you could tell whether somebody was a smoker and, or had TB, but you couldn't really, you know, couldn't distinguish between the two. So it's a really interesting idea because um, it would be amazing to have like a little breathalyzer machine that people could breathe into and that would detect these um, compounds. So I hadn't seen it mentioned before that perhaps it's actually also the cells, maybe damage that's done to them or something that could also be detected. The question would be whether it's specific to the virus um, or the disease that's trying to be detected. Um, but it's a, it's a really neat idea. We obviously have some good tests, so it's not something that's going to be pursued now. Um, but an interesting area of research, I think, for the future. Mike's got a question. It was it was quite a long question. We've shortened it down quite sciencey. Um, but effectively, uh, for the viewers out there, what what he wants to know is about the state of understanding of the virus's persistence on surfaces. Um, how do we really know um, how long? We've discussed this in, in part before, but um, do we know how long a viable virus survives rather than just the traces of the virus? Yeah, so another great question, because a lot of the um, studies that have been done have looked at um, sort of detecting the genetic material of the virus, uh, and you don't need much. So um, it can either be an intact virus that's capable of infecting a cell, or it could just be a bit of de debris, a bit of, a bit of broken up virus that, that is detected. Um, and so in order to know whether it's really viable, what you have to do is do those experiments and then take the whatever it is, the bits of a virus, and then try and infect them, use them to infect another cell. So is there still viable virus there? Um, and so what we know from, I haven't really seen any advances on the studies that were published about a month or so ago, maybe that showed that the virus was viable for up to four hours on copper, 24 hours on cardboard, and two to three days on metal and glass. So I haven't seen any more advance from that. Um, what the other studies that I have seen have, have basically not proven anything beyond just being able to pick up some of the um, just some of the material of the virus. So, yeah, no advances on that. Faye has a question. Uh, according to a stuff story, it's unclear how much of the um, virus you would need to inhale to get sick. Um, but... Um, Researchers from America's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and elsewhere found it was remarkably resilient in the air when aerosolized into smaller particles compared to with um, SARS and MERS. What do you think? Yeah, so again, um, the, the study that I also just talked about, uh, they um, also took the virus and popped it into a machine that makes it airborne, so it aerosolizes it. And the reason they do this is because there are some procedures in hospitals that would result if in a if it, they were done on a patient who had the virus, that it would result in these aerosols. And so it's really important to know how long do these uh, can these hang around in the air because this will determine how those procedures should be done and what you know what disinfectants and um, things need to be need to be done afterwards. As for why um, this, so I guess what I would go back and say is that still all evidence to date points to this being a droplet spread rather than a true airborne virus or disease. Um, so these studies are not relevant in that aspect, aspect, but they are relevant to these sort of hospital conditions. Um, and as for why it's a little bit better than SARS or MERS, uh, who knows? Um, it, yeah, uh, I guess more study needed. <laughs> That is the thing, and I, I, we've got a couple of questions that I'll come to shortly off the Facebook, and I would say that, um, Susie, if you don't know the answers to them, I know you're very good at um, at saying that we'll, we'll actually go off and look at the research, which is an important thing. So um, don't feel that if someone doesn't, a scientist doesn't know the answer to something off the top of their head, that that's a bad thing. It usually means that they need to actually go and look it up and look at the research that has been done on it. So we might ask those questions, <laughs> Susie, if you feel that you can answer them, then cool. If not, we'll come back to them next week. Um, Madeline wants to know, do you know uh, sure. what Tedros meant when he said the worst is yet to come? I wish experts wouldn't be ambiguous. It's scary. I thought he was talking about the virus running through the third world countries, but others seem to think he meant a second wave coming our way or in North America. 
Yeah, so uh, if you don't remember, Tedros is the Director General of the World Health Organization. And so um, I had a look at that clip and it looked like he was talking about, he was basically warning against countries lifting restrictions too soon. So lots of countries seem to think that more people have been infected there than actually have. And that's partly because some of the tests that are being used to do that, these blood tests are so bad that they're kind of giving false readings. And so the real worry is when you lift restrictions too quickly, then the cases start to grow exponentially again. This is why it's really, really important here in New Zealand that we gently move down the alert levels. It's why it's important that when we move to alert level three, people actually treat it like alert level three and not just think, oh, we're kind of back to normal, right? That's why for most of us, it's still gonna be like alert level four because we've seen overseas that if you move too quickly, and people start moving around too much and can, you know, connecting with other people, then the cases start to come back again. And then if, if that happens too fast, you end up back in the same position. And the really difficult thing is because this virus has a lag period where, you know, what we, we don't see the impact of the cases for a couple of weeks after they've happened, it becomes then you have to go back into lockdown to kind of try and control it. Um, if there are too many cases uh, that your contact tracing and things can can look after. So that's what he's talking about. He's warning countries that are lifting their lockdowns too quickly that they need to be really cautious because they're going to start to see exponential spread of the virus again. Jackie on Facebook's got a question which seems pretty um, straight up and down, Susie. Would you send your kids to school or early childhood education right now? Yes, but I can work from home, so I, my child is staying at home. Right, so that's because the official government advice is that if you can keep your child at home, keep your child at home, right? Yes, absolutely. Very good. All right, let's try a couple of these tricky questions. We'll see if we can get, get, get some answers for them. Um, Stacey wants to know, random question, um, is there any indication that for the use of pneumonia vaccines as a preventative against severity for COVID-19? Not that I'm aware of, but I can go and have a look at that. I mean, there's no reason why a pneumonia, so pneumonia has lots of different causes. Um, we will have a, there's a there's a vaccine for a bacterial form of pneumonia. Um, and so there would be no reason why that vaccine would protect against COVID-19. It would protect you from the bacterial version of pneumonia. And obviously if you had both of those diseases at the same time, that would be bad. But I can't see any reason why um, having that vaccine, it wouldn't protect you against the other thing, given that it's a viral infection completely different. Renee's got a question about um, hand sanitizer and the likes. Um, why are we not promoting the use of cleaning and hand sanitizer products that act as a barrier to COVID-19, not just those that sanitize after the fact? Some of those surface products last up to a month and are proven against COVID-19, and the hand sanitizer is a barrier for the whole day. Surely schools and preschools should be using these. That's a great question. So actually, I've seen the data from one of those companies, and the data is very poor to say that it actually lasts on your hand for a day. Honestly, if a student had brought me that data, I would have sent them straight back to the lab. So I don't think that the evidence they're using is very strong, that experiments have not been very well done. And actually, you're way better off just washing your hands. That's the safest thing. The thing that worries me about using some of these barrier things is that they, it's the same as wearing gloves, is they make you end up doing something that's more risky than just being mindful and washing your hands more frequently. Very good. Look, we've got um, one last question and it's going to lead us into our um, video clip of the day. We um, So we'll leave the video clip for the very end, but um, a, a somewhat random question if you haven't seen this clip yet. Um, uh, is it a good idea to inject disinfectants um, into yourself to get rid of COVID-19? <laughs> I can't believe that I would have to tell you that please don't inhale or inject disinfectants. You know, disinfectants are things like bleach and stuff. I mean, they're really dangerous. They generally have warnings on them not to drink them or do anything. So, um, yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> Whoever's thinking that's a good idea. <laughs> um, well, that was from the um, Cafe Scientific, uh, scientific uh, yeah, that word, uh, community. So um, I think they, they know what's coming up at the end of the show. Um, <laughs> on that note, it is 4.30. We have been here. It's time for um, to begin our long weekend, our last long weekend in, in total lockdown. Um, thank you, Susie, for coming along and joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. <laughs> right, and then I see the disinfectant. 
where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. So that you're going to have to use medical doctors with. But it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. So we'll see. But the whole concept of the light, the way it kills it in one minute, that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. Thank you.